Greetings, I'm Dr. Deborah Fennell, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Nurses Society on Addictions webinar series that focuses on the use of opioid therapies for treatment of opioid dependence and on the safe use of opioids in treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of the many resources made available by the Prescriber's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies, a program that is funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Medical Association, American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nur Nursing. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we get to the, the pre presentation today. In the upper right side of your computer screen, you will see a control panel. In the lower portion of that panel, participants can type in a question or comment and submit it to the webinar organizers. You can do that at any time during the presentation. We will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. If we're unable to get to all your questions in the allotted time, Dr. Decker has agreed to respond to them in writing. The webinar presentation slides and questions and answers will be posted on the website in the near future. <coughs> Excuse me, this will be on the PCSSO website as well as the INSA website. Today Dr. Anthony Decker will address pain and addictions, clinical challenges in 2013. He will inform attendees of the epidemic of opioid use in the U.S. He will help you learn to identify use, misuse, abuse, and diversion of opioids, how to use screening tools for misuse of opioids, and to recognize abuse of opioids, as well as being aware of interventions for opioid dependence. Anthony Decker Dio is the director of the Department of Addiction Medicine at the Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, which is one of the replacement hospitals for the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He directs the four divisions in the addiction medicine dedicated to the comprehensive evaluation and treatment for substance abuse and dependence disorders in the military. Dr. Decker is expert in substance dependence and co-occurring disorders in the active duty service member population and with military dependents, retirees, and veterans. He serves on the Provider Wellness and Chronic Pain Committees at Fort Belvoir and is a member of the Joint Board of Directors for the Joint Task Force, the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, National Intrepid Center of Excellence, and his focus there on traumatic brain injuries. After serving in the Indian Health Service for over 12 years in Arizona, he's honored to be a member of the Joint Task Force medical team that specializes in the care of wounded warriors. Previously, he was the acting director of the Office of Health Programs at the Phoenix area office, supervising 15 health departments in Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. He was also the associate director of the Phoenix Indian Medical Center and the director of ambulatory care and community health. He has served as the director of medical education for the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. Dr. Decker is board certified in family practice and osteopathic manipulative treatment, adolescent and young adult medicine, and addiction medicine. He is a fellow in numerous professional society. As a member of the healthcare team at Fort Belvoir Community Hospital, he's dedicated to the mission of providing the highest quality care to active duty military and their dependents. His areas of expertise include addiction, medicine, chronic pain syndromes, informatics, high-risk youth, domestic violence, and behavioral health. He's been the chief clinical consultant in addiction medicine and chronic pain for the Indian Health Service, U.S. Public Health Service, and has served on several national panels addressing substance use in America. He serves on the American Hospital Association Board on Psychiatric and Substance Abuse Issues. His current faculty appointment includes a clinical professorship at George Washington University. We're very pleased to have Dr. Decker here with us today. Welcome, Dr. Decker. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Decker, 
and we'll be discussing challenges that we have in 2013 in working with patients who have chronic pain syndrome and have the disease of addiction. Uh, consistent with the discussion that uh, just preceded uh, me coming on, this is part of the International Nurses Society of Addictions and the Prescribers Clinical Support Service for Opioid Therapies and is funded by the, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration with the grant written up here. The goal right now is to go over the process of clinical challenges, but first I need to make sure that everyone understands that uh, Dr. Decker has uh, no conflicts to report, but his opinions may not necessarily be the opinions of the Indian Health Service, the uh, Department of the Health and Human Services, the United States Public Health Service, or the Department of Defense and its related divisions. We look at opioids as a public health crisis. We have some very startling information. In 2011, the Centers for Disease Control announced that using 2009 data, medication overdoses became the number one reason for accidental death in the United States, superseding car accidents. Now it takes a couple years to process the information, so uh, the, the data sets take a little while. So this is the 2011 report that came out. There were 14,800 deaths that were secondary to prescription opioid pain medications. But for every death, there are 10 people who are admitted to drug treatment centers. There are 32 emergency room visits for misuse and abuse. There are 130 people. For every death, there's 130 people who abuse or are addicted to these opioids. And there's over 800 that have had non-medical use. So this is a very common disorder that has the tip of the iceberg measured with deaths. But the reality is we have a significant list of problems that are associated with the opioid use of disorders. Now we have a couple sets of data here that I'm going to share. First is 2008, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, and it looks at the number of people who have the past month misused their medical, their medical uh, supplies. So when you put all psychotherapeutics, there were 6.2 million people in the past month that had abused their medications. 4.7 of them had abused their pain medications. Now you notice there must be an overlap here. So some people use tranquilizers, such as benzodiazepines, along with pain relievers uh, to create that total column that we have here. But the, but the reality is we have a significant problem. That's 2008. Now let's fast forward to 2012. So these are new initiates, or people who have never used these substances and, and in 2011 began using them. So what's interesting is that marijuana is the most common drug of abuse that has uh, that is a newly initiated substance of abuse. So 2.6 million people who had never used marijuana before in 2010 started using them in 2011. 1.9 million people started using pain relievers for non-medication uses, in other words, for reasons that were not for the prescribed reason. 1.2 million people started using tranquilizers, most in the form of benzodiazepines, and then we started getting into other illegal drugs, ecstasy, which is a stimulant, inhalants, cocaine, other stimulants, LSD, heroin, sedatives, and PCP are listed on this list here. We start looking at non-medical use of pain relievers, looking at lifetime use. 34 million people in the United States have used pain relievers for non-medical purposes. In the last year, it's been 11 million. In the last month, it's 4.7 million. So we see that although there's not people doing it all the time, it's people that have done it in the past, and many of them have stopped doing so or have gotten treatment for it. The most dangerous person using an opioid is a person who has intermittent use. People who use opioids as prescribed have very high doses sometimes, but they don't have significant complications because their bodies and their brains acclimate to the opioid. The recreational user, the intermittent user are the ones that many times run into trouble. When we look at non-medical use for lifetime groupings, we see some interesting findings. A lot of people think that teenagers and young adults are the main users of substances, but if you look at this here, you see a comparison between propoxyphene and codeine products, be like Tylenol 3, 
oxycodone products, which would be several things, including Percocet and oxycontins, hydrocodone products, which would be Vicodin-type products, and tramadol. Tramadol is a non-scheduled mu receptor agonist that has been associated with misuse, abuse, and dependence. And you can see the 12 to 17-year-olds, and that's only a five-year span, has a certain spread in regard to uh, users of those chemicals. The 18 to 25 year olds, as a seven year span, has a significantly larger group. But people older than 26 have a dramatic increase in regard to total numbers, with 15 million people using propoxyphene and codeine products, and over 15 million people using co uh, hydrocodone type products. Vicodin and generic hydrocodone with acetaminophen is the number one drug prescribed in the United States. Atenolol, an antihypertensive, is the number two drug prescribed in the United States. Well, where do these drugs come from? This is based on 2008 National Survey of Drug Use and Health. 75% of them come from friends or family. So we have this data set right here where 56% are for free from friends or family, 9% are purchased from friends or family, and 5% are borrowed or stolen from friends or family. So when you look at that, over 75% of all the opioids that are out on the street and being misused, diverted, or abused are from friends or family. That's an important thing. Some people think that the internet plays a big role right here. The reality is less than half a percent in regard to internet acquisition of opioids. Every time a person comes in and says, I need help, and I actually just saw an 18-year-old who came in uh, with her mother who was asking for help. That person represents 99 other people who need help but don't get it. Of all the people who get services, 95% of them don't even know they have a problem. Of people who need services, 95% don't have the perception that they have a drug or alcohol problem. 3.7% know they have a problem, but they don't make an effort to get help, and only 1% feel they have a problem and actually make an effort to get help. Now, that's a critical factor in looking at the patient who comes into your office who says, I think I have a problem. That person represents a significant number of people who never came to your office and need to have services, so you really want to do as much as possible to help that person who's made the effort to come into your office and get help. Medical marijuana is a challenge, and one of the challenges is that People who use marijuana many times have a change in their ability to remember. They, re they have a difficulty remembering if they actually took a dose, and they also have a difficulty in remembering where they have kept their medication. Now, people who are in chronic opioid therapy should sign an informed consent with patient responsibilities, which clearly says that they'll take their medication as prescribed and that they will store the medication in a safe way. The medicine cabinet is not a safe place. And so that means the patient has to have a plan of either a medication safe or some other way to prevent children or other adults from getting into the medication. Another thing that is interesting is that drug interactions with marijuana appear to be minimal, despite the fact that it has sedating effects, but contaminants in marijuana are still a significant issue, especially Ill illegally purchased marijuana. When a person uses marijuana, it changes their time and space perception. And that does seem to have a relationship with increased accidental injuries. A recent California study identified that 40% of people who were arrested for impaired driving that resulted in an accident had positive tests for marijuana. Now, these are urinary metabolites of THC, but it, it does indicate to us that the patients have used marijuana. Now, I think we need better science in that area because we don't have a good relationship between a person who smoked two days ago and still has a positive test and does it change their psychomotor speed or their ability to drive safely. Science needs to clarify not only the use of marijuana but the indications of CB1 and CB2 receptor agonism. And this is a science that is growing very quickly at this point in time because we have synthetic cannabinoids and we have naturally occurring cannabinoids and CB1 and CB2 receptor agonism are significant in the ways that it changes the action of the substance. When we look at drugs of abuse for people over the age of 50, we know that there are several things that are interesting. The most likely drug of abuse for people over the age of 50 is marijuana. 
the most the second most likely drug of abuse is, is prescription drugs. All other illicit drugs, such as heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, make up a small amount, only 6.1% of people over the age of 50. So marijuana is a lion's share, but prescription drugs are a significant component in the population of adults over the age of 50 who abuse chemicals. Every person in this country who writes for controlled substances needs to be aware of the drug monitoring programs in each state. And this is 2013 data in regard to the status of the drug monitoring programs. The states that are in sort of a light purple color are operational. So I live in the state of Virginia, and Virginia has an excellent program. Previously it was in Michigan and in Arizona. Both of those states have very good programs. What's nice about those programs is that they're immediate response. So you go online and you get, the, you get the response literally within 10 to 15 seconds. Some programs require a little bit more detail. Each state has their own rules. The National All Schedules Pharmacy Monitoring Program, NASPR, is going to require all the states to be online by the end of 2013. So Missouri is the only state that does not have an enacted program. The states that you see in a light brown color are states that have had legislative approval but are still waiting for implementation of their drug monitoring programs. Pain is an interesting issue. Uh, in the military, it's the number one reason that someone seeks services from any healthcare provider. And that makes sense because we have people who are preparing and participating in dangerous activities. But the reality is it's a significant impact on the economy of the United States with over $100 billion being used to cover health care, lost revenue, lost taxes uh, that uh, are related to pain and painful injuries. 40 million physician and provider visits occur each year secondary to pain. And there seems to be a significant effort that uh, the society is recognizing that pain is an area that's highly controversial. We start looking at assessment tools. There's a variety of assessment tools that we as providers can can use. We have some tools that the patient fills out, some tools that the clinic staff can fill out, and some that the clinician has to fill out. And when we start looking at pain patients, some of them are on pain medication questionnaires, some are on opioid misuse questionnaires, and the bottom part of, this, of the uh, information there is looking at patients who have addiction or drug misuse as a significant problem that we're trying to screen out. So screening, brief intervention, and referral for treatment, ESPERT is a good example of people who may be misusing alcohol, and now it's also being used from the standpoint of substances other than alcohol uh, to identify those patients at risk. I need to touch on methadone for a second because methadone had about 700 deaths in 1998, and they had over 6,000 deaths in 2008. So we've had a tenfold increase, in, nearly a tenfold increase in 10 years. Methadone is cheap as dirt, and for the Indian Health Service is a good example. Um, it costs five cents for each five, each 10 milligram methadone tablet. Uh, when when Purdue Pharma was able to get the exclusivity returned to the new formulation of OxyContin, many federal programs switched over to methadone because of the the price differential. The problem is that methadone has multiple drug interactions, and you cannot find a, a stable half-life in methadone from patient to patient. Half-lives may vary from as short as eight hours to as long as 60 hours, and there have been some cases of patients who have half-lives that exceed 100 hours. Now, that becomes a, a critical factor because if you're using methadone in a patient who has a long half-life, they will accumulate methadone. And methadone is a drug that is famous for taking a long time to clear. Patients can many times withdraw from methadone two weeks after cessation of methadone. Methadone also has, which and I don't want people to feel that methadone is a bad choice for, for pain relief. It's actually a very good choice for some patients. It's just that the providers who prescribe methadone need to be very aware of the things that need to be watched closely. Psychomotor speed, voice pressure, disconjugate gaze, uh, uh, deep tendon reflexes, all these things become important to monitor. QT interval changes are also significant in methadone, especially when you start looking at all the drugs that methadone interacts with. 
And so if you have a patient who has a QT interval greater than 450, it's a patient that I would be hesitant to put on methadone. And if I have a patient who has greater than a QTC of greater than 500, I don't feel that it would be appropriate for that patient to be placed on methadone. By the way, we're talking about methadone for pain. We're not talking about methadone for opioid-dependence treatment. Now, there are certain behaviors that individuals have that make you raise an eyebrow and make you concerned that they may be misusing or abusing their medication. Patients who say that they need more medication, that does not mean that patient is addicted. So you need to reevaluate the reason the patient's having pain. Is this patient receiving adequate treatment for their pain? Uh, do the, does the patient have coverage on a time-wise basis that makes sense? In other words, if you give somebody one Percocet once a day, that Percocet has a half-life somewhere, or that oxycodone has a half-life somewhere around four to five hours, and that patient is going to go through two or three half-lives during the day and, and have significant discomfort because the beneficial effect of the medication has been extinguished. Patients who hoard their medications uh, during reduced episodes of pain. So uh, we're in the summertime right now, and patients may decrease the amount of, op of opioid they're taking, but they don't throw those away. They keep them in a bottle, and unfortunately they keep it in their medicine cabinet just in case they have a bad run, uh, a minor injury. Now, drug hoarding is something that we don't want patients to do, but it really is less predictive of a addiction than the more significant findings. Patients sometimes will come in and say that they cannot have certain medications. Doctor, I can't take Tylenol-3. Uh, codeine just doesn't work for me, and I get sick from it. The reality is 20% of Caucasians have a 2D6 metabolism of codeine, and it causes a toxic metabolite. So it, they may be telling you the truth. At the same time, when the patient says, I can't take that medication, there's this medicine this other doctor gave me. It's, uh, it starts with a D, 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 D dilaudid. That medicine really works well. I'd like to have the brand product, four milligram tablets, please. Uh, when patients make those statements, you know we're looking at problems. But it's not unusual for patients to tell you what's worked for them in the past. It's our responsibility as providers to really know what's best for this patient. Acquiring similar drugs from other medical sources if the primary provider is absent or if the patient's being undertreated. They go to the emergency room. They had to go to the dentist, and they got additional medications from the dentist for dental pain in addition to your medications. Those are not seen as addictive behaviors, but those are seen as behaviors that need to be evaluated. Dose escalation on one or two times. I took an extra tablet because I was having a real hard time. I took an extra tablet because something, you know, I had an injury or it was really cold outside. I slipped on the ice. Um, but they should call you. They should contact you, and it should actually be something that you approve, not something where the patient makes the decision on their own. Patients many times realize that if they don't say a certain score when they come into the clinic, and the Joint Commission has given us the responsibility to assess, evaluate, and reevaluate uh, pain care and pain scores, um, that doesn't mean that the patient is addictive when they come in and their scores are always seven, eight, or nine, because if they give you a score of two or three and you don't give them their medication, they learn pretty quickly that they need to have a higher score. The better thing is to have a functional scale. What is this patient able to do functionally? The pain scores are highly non-reproducible, and they, they are many times unhelpful in evaluating pain. Now. There are behaviors that are definitely predictive of an addiction. Patients who sell your prescription medications are violating federal law and many state laws when they do so. If you refill a medication that the patient says, well, I had to sell my OxyContin so I could pay my car payment, but I need to have some more. If you refill those medications, that is a violation of the Controlled Substance Act, and that is illegal. Patients forge prescriptions. The electronic health record is a wonderful advance, tongue-in-cheek when I say this, uh, to our ability to provide health care, but it, when it goes down, you're back to paper. And, uh, and unfortunately, EHRs are not infallible. Patients who steal, or I love the term, borrow drugs from other people, obtaining prescription drugs from non-medical sources. Well, where did you get that medication? Well, I have a friend. He sold me some. Uh, Patients who have a concurrent abuse of alcohol or other illicit drugs. Now, notice I said abuse of alcohol or, non, or other illicit drugs. So a person who says, well, 
I was at a wedding and I had a, I toasted the, the the bride and groom with some champagne. I'm not going to be overly concerned about that. Now, if they tell me they drank two bottles of champagne at the wedding, I'm very concerned about that. So intoxication with alcohol and use of illicit drugs are all things that are significant and should be seen predictive of an addiction. Multiple dose escalations, this is in comparison with the other one, was just one or two dose escalations, and other non-compliance with therapies would be consistent with addiction, and aberrant administration of their medications. Well, Dr. Decker, um, i got to be honest with you, the Opana, when I crush it up and snort it, it works a lot better. Uh, those types of statements would be consistent with addiction. Anytime patients have affectionate names for their medications, my Gabby's, my Perky's, my Zannies, those are poor signs. Those are signs that we need to be very careful. Other behaviors that we need to be aware of, uh, patients who seem to lose their medication on a regular basis. We had one of our service members who said he had spilled all of his oxycodone in the sink. I said, bring back the sludge. He said, what sludge? I said, the sludge is in your sink. Bring it back. We'll reassess it. He said, I don't have any sludge left. Well, uh, his medications were not replaced. We need to make sure patients have signed informed consents to be on these medications and they understand that there are responsibilities that they must adhere to. Prescriptions from other clinicians or emergency rooms without seeking permission from the primary prescriber. That's very important. So if a patient's getting meds from other places and you find out about this with the pharmacy monitoring program, that needs to be confronted. The patient needs to understand that it's unacceptable behavior. If a patient has a deterioration in their overall function, so you ask the spouse, how is the patient doing today? He's got no pain. He feels a lot better. He's been in bed for three days. Bad sign. So we need to make sure that the patient's function improves with the treatment of pain, not the other way around. And patients who are resistant to change in therapy despite significant side effects of the drug, overdoses, sleep apnea, um, other respiratory problems, falls because of uh, over-medication, those are all reasons for patients to have their medication changed, but if you have someone who refuses, then you've got to think that the medication may be, in, may be misused or abused. What is our different differential diagnosis when we start looking at aberrant drug-related behaviors? Well, the first thing you've got to think of is that maybe this is an addiction issue. Pseudo-addiction is when you're not treating the patient adequately for pain and they are asking for more medications. In a way, many times it's desperate. Other psychiatric disorders will contribute to patients having aberrant behaviors. It's important to have a reasonable behavioral health assessment. Patients can develop encephalopathy because of their medical disorder. They can also develop encephalopathy because of their medication. Anoxic encephalopathy is a very common one that occurs in patients who have sleep disorders and are on high dose or chronic opioid medications. Family disturbances, family disruption, teenagers stealing the medication, adults stealing the medications, ad older adults borrowing the medication, patients who have criminal intent. They have every intention to take your medications and sell them. And they're going to come in with a story that that uh, is going to take time to tease the truth from the untruth. There may be an exacerbation of the pain syndrome. Patients have a flare of autoimmune disorders. Patients have recurrent injuries. Musculoskeletal disorders can become worse. And sometimes the effect of the opioid itself, whether they're hyperalgesia syndrome or other types of changes that occur in the brain because of chronic opioid administration. The syndrome of opioid abuse and dependence, which is now the syndrome of opioid use disorders, we're using DSM-5 criteria, um, is a significant issue. Patients will have a change in their function despite having an increase in their medication because they're using the opioid not for tra pain treatment but for withdrawal or for uh, the, pro the process of feeling high. Other substance use disorders will complicate opioids. It's rather interesting because patients who used amphetamines, and we saw a significant epidemic of methamphetamine in the West, many of them burn out their receptors to amphetamines and the mu receptor becomes very, very uh, um, stimulated with opioid stimulation and people switch over to chronic opioid use. Exacerbation of the pain syndrome, other medical problems, and that hyperalgesia syndrome, which describing it briefly means the more opioid you give, the worse the patient feels and has greater pain. Buprenorphine. Buprenorphine does not have an indication for the treatment of pain with the exception of injectable buprenorphine and the transderm patch, Butrans. However, 
sublingual buprenorphine has been used. This is off-label. I need to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, Herb Malinoff at the University of Michigan treated 95 consecutive patients who were placed on long-term opioid therapy, most of them for uh, failed back surgery and low back problems, and they failed. They failed because they had increased pain, they failed because they had decreased functional capacity, and 8% of them had become opioid addicted. He placed them on buprenorphine, uh, mean dose was 8 milligrams per day, and 86% of the population uh, reported moderate to substantial relief of pain and improved function and mood. So buprenorphine has some capacity, but science has not given us, or I should say the FDA has not given us the opportunity to use it on label. Buprenorphine and benzodiazepines are a concern. And this is something that anyone who's using buprenorphine or treating patients who have buprenorphine need to be aware of. The average person breathes 16 times a minute. When a person's on chronic buprenorphine or chronic opioid therapy, the respiratory rate drops down to 12 to 13 times per minute. When the patient has benzodiazepine added to the mixture, they lose their side reflux. And so patients who are in chronic opioid therapy many times have a decreased respiratory rate, but they compensate with a deep sigh every so often. You place a, you place a patient on benzodiazepines, it appears that, at least in rats, you lose that side reflux and that becomes a significant issue. Human studies have also shown that benzodiazepines decreases the ability or at least the rate of deep breathing secondary to size. So now we have a situation where we have patients who have chronic opioid administration and we have a new opioid provider. So you've inherited this patient, the provider is retired in the area or moved from the area, and you have to ask yourself, are chronic opioids appropriate? There are three categories I like to go with. The yes category, the no category, and those are the two easy ones, and then the big one, which is the unsure. So even if you have a patient who has a good diagnostic workup, evidence of need to be treated for pain, you have a treatment goal, you measure functional status, you have a pain policy and procedure at your facility, and then you monitor progress. You still do medication counts, you still do functional assessments, you still do the refill flow chart, you do occasional urine toxicology, and you adjust the medications based on what is clinically appropriate. You're still watching for scams. So the yes column, even though it's relatively easy, is something that still requires some work on the part of the provider. The no column is pretty easy too, because what happens is the patient has a history of an overdose. The patient is found selling their drugs. The patient tries to alter a prescription. These are all indications to stop treating that patient with opioids. Now you can stop them with a slow or a quick taper, you're going to document the chart. You can do it up to a 10-week taper, or you can do as quickly as a one-week taper, depending on the opioid that you're using. You can also let the patient know what the symptoms of withdrawal are, and if you are a wavered provider, office-based opioid therapy, OBOT, through the DEA, is a possibility. If you tell the patient to go to the emergency room, you will not be friends with the ER staff very long because the ER has a difficult time in managing these patients who are coming in for opioid refills and many times they're simply told to go back to their primary care provider. Patients who have irregularities in their chemical dependent screening, patient says, well, I had a DUI in 1998, uh, but that's all done now, I'm fine. Uh, you, need to, you need to pursue further as to what's going on with that patient. Toxicology tests are not rock solid, they're not forensic for most part. You don't have chain of custody, you don't have observed urines in many situations. Most providers do not test the specific gravity of the urine nor the temperature of the urine. Uh, most providers are not medical review officers. But what happens is that you have a patient on a medication, you'd like to see the metabolites of that medication in the urine, and you'd also like to see none of the metabolites that are illegal in that patient's urine. So toxicology screening becomes an important part of treating patients on long-term opioid therapies. Medication counts, monitor for scams, checking the pharmacy, uh, ph pharmacy monitoring programs all become part of the usual practice when working with patients who are on opioids. And when you have these findings in the unsure area, it becomes a reason to push that patient down to should this patient be off of medication. When we're trying to identify how can we switch medications from one 
one medication to another. This, this is another controversial area in medicine. The, the single dose kinetics are very different than the multiple dose kinetics. So if we have a patient who's on morphine, they're taking 30 milligrams of morphine a day orally, it would be equal to about 10 milligrams of morphine injected. 30 milligrams of morphine orally is about the same as 20 milligrams of oxycodone or 20 milligrams of hydrocodone. Hydromorphone, brand name is Dilaudid, is a medication that is significantly stronger injected than it is taken orally. Uh, injected hydromorphone is 20 times stronger than oral morphine. Fentanyl is only available in a either parenteral dose or a transderm dose. The fentanyl lollipops is also available, with a, uh, but that's a different administration than pills. Fentanyl is a very fast acting and a very short half-life uh, opioid, but it's delivered in a variety of ways. And fentanyl does have significant overdose capacity if the patient's receiving too much. If we start looking at what is the history been of, of opioid use? We've got some challenges here. And I'm going to go through quickly this uh, particular study that was um, printed in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2008 by Phillips. What they did was they looked at uh, opioid medications and overdose deaths. And the consequences were significant. They found out that people who had alcohol or street drugs in their home had a significant rise in the likelihood of having mortality secondary to opioids. So they measured deaths between 1983 to 2004, and they put in a two-by-two two box. People who died in the home, people who died outside the home, and, and the other side of the box was there were drugs and alcohol in the home or there were not drugs and alcohol in the home. So this is our two-by-two by two box right here. Now, if we go over the course of time from 1983 to 2004, you can see that fatal medication errors had a rise that's very predictable and almost logarithmic. Fatal, sur fatal surgical errors, alcohol and street drug deaths, fatal adverse drug events, um, non-medication poisonings, and all accidents combined stay steady throughout that time. Now, if we look at the most significant area, it's people who died in the home and had drugs or alcohol in the home, there was a 32-fold increase in deaths in this community. And that's a significant finding that, that has to have at least a response from the medical and nursing communities. What's interesting, too, is that when they looked at these deaths, most of the deaths occurred between ages 49, 40 and 49 and 50 and 59 as far as total deaths. Now, we started looking at self-administration of a medication at home is least likely to have professional oversight. So one of the recommendations that they had here is that there needs to be better screening of patients who have drug and alcohol problems, which includes the verbal screening, is there anyone else in the home that has a drug or alcohol problem, taking extra precautions when prescribing medications with known dangerous interactions with drugs and alcohol needs to be monitored, and I think the patient needs to give an assigned consent uh, to be on medications that uh, have potential for overdose, and emphasizing that the patient is increasing their risks when they mix drugs and alcohol with their opioids. Now, pharmacy impact is significant. Written and oral patient education counseling becomes important. Black box warnings become important. And what's interesting is that the pharmacist can have a significant beneficial effect in regard to the care of the patient. Those patients that have alcohol or drug problems uh, have, have the burden of high expectations by the public. The public believes that if you have a problem, you need to take care of it. And so you should be able to be safely detoxed, that you should not misuse all the medical services in the community, that any criminal activity needs to just stop, that family disruption and return to employment need to improve. So the family disruption needs to stop, and people need to be self-supportive. They, they need to prevent all the relapses, and they need to be cured of their addiction. The problem is, that doesn't happen very often. So the gold standard that we have, not only for methadone maintenance, but really the gold standard for all treatment programs is to improve their overall survival, to retain people in treatment, to decrease their illicit opioid use, decrease seroconversion to viral infections and other infectious diseases, 
normalize the immune and endocrine systems, decrease criminal activity, increase employment, and in perinatal addiction, improve birth outcomes. That's the gold standard. It's, uh, it's something that we all try to adhere to in working with patients who have addictions. Now, for people who have been switched over from opioids to buprenorphine, there was a study that was published in The Lancet that was very interesting. Keiko is from uh, Stockholm, and uh, he was able to convince the Swedish medical research systems to do a study. They didn't have agonist therapy in Sweden at the time. So every patient went through six days of buprenorphine detox. So they stopped their opioid of choice, went into withdrawal, they were rescued with buprenorphine, and after six days they were randomized into one or two groups. One group was placed on a placebo, which is our green boxes here. One group was placed on buprenorphine, which is our red circles here. Over the course of a year, it's a one-year study, all of the people that were in the placebo group dropped out. The person who lasted the longest was 61 days. So people say, well, how long can you stay sober without any other services as, as far as uh, agonist therapy? In this study, it was 61 days. Now, this program had a lush environment of services, job training, housing, food services, were all part of this particular intervention. Everybody received that. The only difference was some people got buprenorphine, some people got a placebo after the withdrawal phase. Now with the buprenorphine group, one person dropped out on day one, four more people dropped out over the course of a year. By the end of a year, there were still 15 people, or three-fourths, were still engaged in the buprenorphine arm. In the placebo group, the last person dropped out at day 61. In the placebo group, four people overdosed on heroin during this study and died. In the control group, none of these people up here overdosed and resulted in mortality. Now, 20% of injection drug users in the United States meet an overdose fatal event each year. So it's, uh, this Sweden was exactly the same as the United States from that data point. But the interesting thing is even people who have been treated and drop out, they still have some protective factor. And that protective factor is that they are still engaged in some kind of activity that prevents them from relapsing or overdosing. France has had sublingual buprenorphine since 1995 period. They had a significant drop in overdose deaths, an 80% drop in overdose deaths secondary to opioid overdoses when buprenorphine was introduced to France. There is a problem when we look at other controversies of diversion of buprenorphine. I live in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, and there's a significant diversion process going on in Baltimore, and we've had many of our patients who admitted they go up to Baltimore to buy their buprenorphine. Um, buprenorphine diverted is interesting because most of the people who abuse the buprenorphine are abusing it to treat an opioid withdrawal. John Renner from Boston University uh, published in 2008 at the Buprenorphine Summit, a variety of information sets uh, in which about half a million people have been treated. In 2012, that number has exceeded uh, 2.5 million people have been treated with buprenorphine. About a third of the patients are treated are just for detox, and detox alone has been shown to have no beneficial effect on the burden of illness of the disease on those particular patients. There are now over 20,000 providers who have been trained to prescribe buprenorphine. At the present time, this is a challenge because only physicians who have unrestricted DEAs can prescribe buprenorphine. Uh, there's been a significant movement to have nurse practitioners eligible to prescribe buprenorphine that is still going through the legislative process. The Baltimore Sun identified that they were, in 2008, that they were uh, a significant number of physicians who knew that buprenorphine was being illegally traded and that those numbers were climbing. They also said that the drug used on the street was mostly to avoid withdrawal and not so much to get high. That being said, the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, REMS, needs to be included not only for all opioids but also for buprenorphine. Any chemical that can be misused or abused needs to be identified uh, in the REMS process to decrease the likelihood that those abuses will occur. 
I'm going to go ahead and stop now. We've got uh, about 12 more minutes uh, to take any chat questions or comments. And so I'm looking at my chat area right now. And, Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Decker, let me just um, pop in here and thank you for an excellent and informative presentation. Um, there are some questions that have come in and we'll get to those in a minute. Um, and we do have, uh, as Dr. Decker mentioned, some time for questions. So you continue to submit those uh, throughout the webinar. <clears throat> uh, as the moderator, I'm going to take uh, the privilege um, to, to kind of kick off here with a comment. Um, early in the presentation, you talked about the number of people who were unaware that they have a problem or those who did have a problem uh, who could benefit from treatment, a very small proportion of those actually move forward to get treatment. Uh, so I just want to do a shout out, since we're the International Nurses Society on Addictions, to um, nurses. Uh, as the largest group of healthcare providers and the most trusted by Americans uh, to really say that we do have an opportunity here to help to increase that proportion of that 99% who are un unaware that they have a problem and who could benefit. So um, nurses in all settings, all specialties, working with all populations really have that opportunity to screen, assess, and provide brief interventions. Um, and for those of you who have not heard yet, the American Nurses Association has endorsed that nurses um, should be able to uh, conduct expert strategies and they're really encouraging those skills in the nursing workforce. So uh, we hope that in a couple of years we'll see some changes in those data. Um, so um, that's, that's just my my kind of public service announcement. <laughs> um, so here's a question that came in, Dr. Decker. Why do you consider the, uh, quote, the need for more drug, unquote, to be aberrant behavior? Uh, it can be, but um, the person who wrote in said, I usually find it's usually an acclimation, which is a well-recognized reaction. Uh, and I said that uh, increasing doses for patients who have increasing pain is not predictive of a addiction, but patients who have dose escalations, especially without the provider's participation, that's a highly suspect area. So you, you prescribe a patient a, an opioid and you give them a two-week supply, they come back four days later and they say, I used it all up. Um, that, would be, that would be a problematic situation, but you've got to take each case individually because if, if a patient has significant pain and you gave them two Tylenol, three per day, and that was it, you're not going to get significant pain relief from uh, codeine. Uh, whereas if you gave the patient four milligrams of Dilaudid six times a day and they still said they need more, you got a problem. So the, the goal here is to know what to prescribe based on the pathology that presents. You have someone who's got an acute injury, they've got a fracture and, uh, and they're in significant pain, that's one thing. But you know, pain is a very subjective issue. Some patients have unusually brisk responses to pain with minimal trauma. Other people have a need to increase the dose very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the, one of the points is that we need to look at um, people individually um, as unique individuals and then we also need to look at more um, than just a single indicator of, of behavior. Uh, we need to really look at the whole um, clinical picture as well. Right, and, I, and I'll tell you that uh, I'm not happy with the pain scale of 0 to 10. It, uh, it does not provide good reproducibility and it does not tell us what the patient's actually experiencing in regard to their function. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a good numeric scale for function, so that takes a little time for the provider to interview the patient, find out what the patient is able to do and how their pain has affected that ability. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, uh, how do you monitor for scams? So, Well, anybody who's written a scheduled medication has been scammed. That's number one. Uh, <laughs> because the people who are really good at it do it very well. At the same time, uh, I think this is part of the skill of interviewing. Uh, I like to 
listen to the patient and be engaged with the patient when I'm with them the first time. I like to look at their pupils and their eyes. And if you have a patient, now if you've got a person who's on opioids, you're going to have constricted pupils. The only exception is Demerol, but you hardly see any Demerol anymore. But uh, if, you're, if they're saying something that's emotionally charged, they're going to have a catecholamine release. And they're going to have a, a pupillary dilation. You're also going to see a change in their voice pressure, and you're asking questions. Well, have you seen anyone else for any other medical problems where you receive prescriptions? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, so as providers, you tune into that, and and I'm always concerned that there's these little on the EHR. There's yes no boxes, and there's a lot of responses that don't fit into yes or no, and so uh, we need to have the ability to capture data that's usable and reproducible. So scams require a certain amount of scam gar that uh, that the provider is tuned into. There is a thing called opioidophobia, which is the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the PA or the dentist that feels so scared of opioids, they will not prescribe it even when it's clearly indicated. There have been very good data. Uh, there was a study that was done at the LA uh, County and another one that was done at uh, the uh, county hospital in Atlanta, uh, Grady Hospital, in which people of color would get 50% less opioids for long bone fractures irrespective of coverage. So they, they measured Blue Cross Blue Shield to Blue Cross Blue Shield. And if you were a person of color, Hispanic in LA or black in Atlanta, you had a 50% less chance of getting a opioid for a long bone fracture. So we need to make sure that we educate people how to be competent in making decisions as to who should be on an opioid, how to prescribe the opioid safely, and how to monitor those. Now chronic pain is tough because chronic pain doesn't make sense. Uh, low back pain does not benefit from chronic opioid administration, yet 70% of all the opioids we prescribe in this country is for low back pain. So we have some education to do that helps people become more astute, more appropriate, and more geared towards interventions that benefit the patient. Acute exacerbation of low back pain is one thing, but chronic low back pain with chronic opioid administration does not make good clinical sense. Great, thank you. Um, if uh, Next question is, if a physician or a prescriber finds out the patient has been buying opioids in the street in addition to filling prescriptions, um, should uh, the, the rel physician-patient relationship be terminated or would you attempt to educate, assist the patient with treatment? Okay, this depends on the provider more than anything else, not so much the patient because this scenario happens all the time from patient standpoints. In my business, um, I, we work with patients who have addictions. And so if a person comes in here and they, they've been buying drugs on the street or they have, they have morphine metabolites in their system when they're on oxycodone and they can't explain it, that patient gets more visits. So that means they have to come in to see me twice a week now. Uh, and so it's not a matter of saying, well, uh, you violated my agreement here. I'm never going to see you again. Here's a list of three doctors and don't ever come back here again. Uh, in addiction medicine, we don't really have the option or I should say we minimize that option of terminating patients because we realize that this is, that's exactly what they're here to see us for. Patients who have the complication of addiction and a pain disorder make it very challenging. The Controlled Substance Act does not prohibit the use of opioids in an opioid addicted patient, but it clearly says it can only be used for intractable pain. That term intractable is part of the act. So I would recommend that if you're going to treat somebody who is an opioid dependent patient that you include the term intractable if they actually meet that clinical criteria. Then what happens is that you have to be very careful. Now, they don't define what careful means. I would tend to mean that you're, I would tend to think it means that we need to be very careful in regard to monitoring medications, monitoring drug screens, making sure that functional assessments are done on a regular basis checking collateral information to make sure the patient is using the medications appropriately and not gasping for air in the middle of the night or having long apneic spells, uh, making sure the patient understands that there are legal consequences for misuse or diversion or abuse and that, uh, that we want this patient to have benefit of the treatment but also to understand that the treatment, the treatment may be vulnerable if they continue to misuse or abuse their chemicals. 
Great, thank you. Um, undoubtedly, this uh, is something that other people would be um, appreciative of, but um, wondered if uh, there are risk assessment tools that could be recommended, uh, either a list of those tools uh, or uh, a reference list or a, a meta um, review that has been conducted. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the screen right now we have risk assessment tools, examples of them, and uh, some of them are short. Uh, uh, the opioid risk tool is only five questions patient answers at. Uh, some of them are long. Uh, the uh, prescription drug use questionnaire is 40 questions, and clinic staff actually does that. So we've included that, and uh, this is uh, out of an uh, article that was published in 2008 and another one in 2009. But uh, these are available. Uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has many of these uh, in PDF form on their website. So I think it's reasonable to screen patients. Uh, some patients feel a little overwhelmed by walking in and having four or five pages handed to them that they have to fill out every time they come in. But I, don't, I think it's appropriate for us to assess patients who have substance use disorders and have chronic pain syndrome to maintain their safety. When you realize so many patients are dying from accidental overdose deaths, we've got to raise the bar in regard to how we monitor patients and how we as assess patients before they're placed on these medications. Great. So um, as, as um, we, ex as certainly I anticipated, I thought this would be a very um, uh, interesting and uh, timely topic, and we do have a number of questions that we're not going to be able to get to during this session, but I thank you in advance for uh, providing a written response to those questions, uh, which we will be posting on our website. So Dr. Decker, I want to again thank you for your uh, interesting and your really uh, thought-provoking and challenging presentation. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Our time is up, and we, I do want to thank you, uh, you all for participating in the webinar. Uh, shortly, you'll receive an email from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that includes a link to an evaluation survey, and we would ask you to take a few minutes to access it and provide your feedback on today's session. This webinar today was recorded, and it will be posted on the website of the Physician's Clinical Support System Opioid Therapies in the Near Future, and that site is www.pcss-o.org. A calendar of upcoming events and helpful clinical resources are also available on that website. All of this information can also be find, found on our INSA website at www.intnsa.org as well. And we do hope that you'll join us for upcoming PCSSO sessions. We thank you for your time today.